Hello, my friend. My name is Byron, and I'm from the BJJ Brick Podcast. I want to thank you for checking out the podcast on the YouTube channel here. It's a weekly show dedicated to Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and having fun on the mats. Enjoy the show. Thank you for listening to the BJJ Brick Podcast. We'll be bringing you Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and good times. We hope to flatten your jiu-jitsu learning curve, help you get the most out of your grappling ability, and meet your goals both on and off the mat. Welcome back, my friends, to the BJJ Brick Podcast. Uh, this is episode 230 coming out. It should be a bonus episode coming out on the first of the month. I have on the line with me Gary and Byron. How you guys doing? We're doing awesome, Joe. Can't wait for this BJJ Brick Extra episode. It's going to be a, a great time. Yep, doing great. Gary just got done getting his nails done, and uh, he's looking great. And, you know, here we are podcasting again with this extra episode this month. Oh, you got to look pretty, Gary. You got <laughs> to keep that going. Yeah, you know, last week uh, it was a new sweater, and this week uh, getting my nails done. So, um, <laughs> you know, next week I might get my toenails done if anybody can you know, find, uh, you know, uh, something that I can, uh, you know, get rid of the fungus with. So, uh, maybe I'll do that. So what I want to know though, Gary is <laughs> you've had a few outings the last few weeks, but three weeks ago we had a couple's massage and you haven't invited me over since. What's well, up? I think, well, I think you know what happened there, Joe, and that's the reason I don't want to invite you back. We'll, <laughs> we'll leave that private. Also, I remember it was kind of like, uh, the movie, uh, Oh, what's the name of that movie? Well, it's not been very good. <laughs> <laughs> How could I not think? What's the name of that movie with John Travolta and Samuel L. Jackson? Oh, you're thinking about uh, Pulp Fiction. Pulp, Pulp Fiction. Fiction. Yeah. It kind of reminded me of Pulp Fiction uh, when uh, uh, Vin Rang was in, uh, was in the basement of the, the, the guy's uh, pawn shop. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, Joe, what do we have this week uh, on this extra episode? We have Jose Lopez, Pagan Lafont, and Shane Dupree. Uh, they're all guys that I train with pretty regular, a uh, couple of purple belts and a, a brown belt. And I invited them on to talk about a position and a submission that's been working well with them. And, and we kind of get deep into it. So I'm, I'm excited for it. And I hope uh, the listeners get something out of it. Yeah, I'm sure we all will, and we're looking forward to sharing that with everybody. Uh, so a lot on the main podcast that comes out every Monday, uh, we have a quote of the week and an article of the week on this extra episode. We want to change things up and have fun here, and we have a tip of the week where uh, Gary doesn't give the tip, but uh, I'm going to give the tip uh, this week, or this I guess this month uh, is how it would be said, but it's real simple. Just a simple concept that, uh, that I've noticed that many people don't really uh, notice. When you're when you're grappling with somebody and you're at the edge of the mat and you get back into the you know towards the mat, uh, you know that's that's a good thing. It's safe to stay to where if they sweep you, you don't fall off the mat and, and you don't want to end up like into the wall or into the concrete or whatever else could be uh, hazardous material. A, a two by four with a nail sticking out of it could be next to that, which would be probably a bad idea. But uh, one thing that some people don't notice is that you tend to move, especially if you're uh, trying to pass the guard or you're, someone's in the guard, you tend to, to generally move towards uh, the person playing guard towards their head. So just think of it as the person on top is kind of just pushing and you're slowly inching that direction. Uh, that being said, you can get swept back or swept to the side. But when you reset, face the person who's playing guard, face their head towards the biggest space and mat that you have. And generally speaking, you will have to reset less often. Uh, have you guys noticed that pattern? Well, what I have noticed is occasionally I'll go to class and it'll be a very small class, like just four of us. And we'll always be in the same nine square feet of space. <laughs> I, 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 I don't know how that happens, but it does. Uh, but no, that's a, that's a good point, Brian, Byron. I hadn't thought about it too much, but... Yeah, oftentimes it's not a matter of space, but proper orientation, and everybody can find some room to work. Yeah, and in, in a crowded space, and uh, it's it's so funny that people uh, will gravitate towards one side of the mat versus the other, and there'll be one side that's just mostly empty with all the smelly guys, 
and one side was all the regular students. <laughs> no, uh, space out and really use that space that's available to you because a lot of times people, hate to say it, can get injured from somebody else falling on them. Just total accident, kind of a freak thing. But a lot of times these freak things that are accidents can be avoided but by safe setup. And uh, take a look around and think about the technique you're going to do. Maybe it involves like a pretty big movement or maybe knocking somebody over. And make sure that space is clear before you pull that off. Uh, make it safer because anybody can get hurt in some weird thing with somebody falling on them. The person falling can get hurt. This person they can land on can get hurt. Just a bad deal. Train safe, my friends. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> that, that was the tip. <laughs> we, we could give you more, but the tip should be enough for now. <laughs> that should get you by. <laughs> <laughs> we got to rename that segment because it, it's always going to go bad. Definitely going to go bad. Well, yeah, uh, we were talking about trying to stay safe on the mats. You know, staying ha- stay, staying safe is going to keep us healthy. And uh, we basically have a, a sponsor, a Health IQ, which is a life insurance company. Um, they're a life insurance company that has special rates for individuals who are health conscious, uh, you know, people who are jujitsu people, runners, cyclists, weightlifters, uh, vegans, you know, get lower rates on their life insurance. Um, definitely uh, call them up, uh, get a quote, mention BJJ Brick if you call them. This is Byron coming in from the editing room. I just want to leave this little clip in. Gary is reading some of the notes that are with us for Health IQ, kind of helping us talk about it. And he's going to mess up the link because they give us a unique link that tells them who's sending them the traffic. And Gary just reads it as unique link instead of BJJ Brick. And it's kind of funny. He did it last week, so I figured I better leave it in. These episodes are actually recorded back to back on the same weekend. And so he, he's really giving himself a hard time about this. I thought it was pretty funny. So we're leaving it in. And here goes Gary talking about the unique link. But really the easiest way is find the link in the show notes. Get a free quote online, healthiq.com backslash unique link. <laughs> nice. Yes, the unique link will be a BJJ brick, but we'll put a link Damn, in the I show. I said that again. <laughs> I thought you did that on purpose. I thought, I thought so. I didn't do it on purpose, guys. Good job. Uh, yeah. So uh, check out the show notes. There'll be a link in there uh, where you can check out Health IQ. Uh, really a, a cool concept. It's like rewarding the people who drive safely with a better car insurance rate, uh, rewarding people who take care of their bodies. And now uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is recognized as something that uh, people are taking care of their bodies, living longer because we do this. And we're able to do this into our older ages. Uh, that's also kind of a cool concept that if you think about it, they're sponsoring this podcast because uh, a lot of people do just do into their older ages. And, you know, it's not usually the kids who are going out there looking for life insurance. It's the responsible adults. And uh, make that responsibility a big deal. Check out the link and uh, do their quiz. Not the and, unique link. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> check it out and let them know that uh, we sent you. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great thing to save money on. And you deserve it because you are training hard on the mats, my friends. Yep, don't pay more than you deserve to pay. Go to healthiq.com backslash BJJ Brick and find out about their exclusive rates that you might apply for. Hey, I uh, really want to mention that we have an event coming up, um, officially on the calendar. Um, the big days are going to be June 23rd and June 24th. June 23rd, the BJJ Brick Camp. Tim Sled, Roy Delgado are going to be teaching seminars. Uh, going to be a blast here in Wichita, Kansas. Uh, June 24th, the BJJ Brick crew takes over, and we're going to be showing lots of jiu-jitsu stuff and, and having a good time with you guys on the mat. Probably a lot of rolling. Uh, not for sure what we're going to be uh, teaching that day, but uh, it's going to be basically as the biggest get-together we've had for uh, the BJJ Brick podcast and uh, looking at getting Joe in town from Houston uh, and, uh, and meeting him uh, and... Uh, yeah, this is going to be great. Also on uh, Friday, June 22nd, uh, tentative open mat. If if you come to town earlier uh, than the Saturday, that would be open for you, which would be cool. But it's going to be a big get-together, a lot of fun, looking at giving incentives and rewards for the out-of-town guests traveling to Wichita. Uh, we're going to be giving away some DVDs that I've reviewed and I have just sitting in my closet. Love to give those out to you guys. So out-of-town guests will have first-come, first-serve on that. 
If you're thinking about traveling, coming to this event, send us an email, btjbrick at gmail.com. Let us know. I'll kind of put you down and, and see which DVD you want. And uh, definitely uh, a lot of uh, giving away gee patches, stickers, whatever. I also want to say this. If you're a Patreon supporter, I don't know for sure how much the seminar costs. Uh, we're not actually technically running the seminar. Uh, our uh, friend here in town, it's going to be his gym. But if you're a Patreon supporter, uh, we're going to cover that for you uh, just as a thank you back to you. Uh, you guys on Patreon have really made a huge difference uh, with the podcast. And uh, just, I know that not all Patreon supporters are going to be able to make it, but if you're able to make it, know that we got you covered. I mean, how's that? Go ahead, Joe. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to this. I'm looking forward to meeting Gary and Byron for the first time. And man, it'd be awesome to have a dozen or more Patreon supporters there and get to meet some of our listeners and roll with y'all and, uh, it's going to be a really good time. Yep, and then the All Star Cast on Saturday with uh, Tim Sled and Roley Delgado. You know, I, I've had two seminars so far from Roley Delgado. I learned a lot. Tim Sled, I'm looking forward to learning from him. And also, congratulations to Roley. He just uh, won his uh, fight to win match with the uh, with the uh, ankle lock, and he switched to uh, uh, I don't know what he calls that grip, the cable switch. Yeah, grip. I saw and, that. Uh, man, that's that's phenomenal, and uh, that was fun to watch. But uh, congratulations, Roley. Yep, I can't speak for Sunday, but certainly Saturday. If y'all come, you'll get smarter. <laughs> <laughs> Sunday is the beach to brick to crew. So, well, Sunday, you'll probably lose brain cells. <laughs> our our goal is to just have a blast with the people that are at the seminar, whether you're uh, from in town or out of town. We're going to try to plan uh, some things that are on and off the mat, a lot of fun, eating together, having a good time, uh, going to. I don't know what we're going to do for sure, but uh, just plan to have a great time this weekend. What'd you say, Gary? Pedicures. Pedicures. <laughs> Gary will take a small group out to get pedicures while the rest of us do something fun. <laughs> but uh, that's kind of our goal is to just have a good time and, and meet you guys and, and to learn a lot of jiu-jitsu uh, and to teach and share some jiu-jitsu as well. Maybe even a recording of the podcast or probably at least some video content will get put on the YouTube page. So uh, really excited to share that with you guys. All right, guys, that brings us to the portion of our podcast where we do an interview. And this week it will actually be three interviews. We'll have on the line next Jose Lopez, a purple belt uh, from Brazilian top team, Angleton, Texas. We'll have uh, Pagan LaFont, who is a brown belt uh, at LaRose Martial Arts in LaRose, Louisiana. And Shane Dupree, who is also from southeast Louisiana, and he's a purple belt. I'm excited to have these guys on. He is the most interesting grappler in the world. In an effort to blend traditional martial arts with BJJ, he was successful in breaking five cinder blocks with his triangle choke. He put Frankie Valley in a triangle, and he screamed for Sherry Baby. In an effort to fight crime, he likes to check in on Facebook when he is in a bad neighborhood. I don't always listen to podcasts, but when I do, I prefer the BJJ Brick Podcast. Stay sweaty, my friends. I have on the line with me Jose Lopez. Jose is a competitor from south of Houston, Texas, down in Lake Jackson. Jose, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing pretty good. How are you, Joe? I'm doing good. It's good to have you on the show. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself before we get started. Uh, again, my name is Jose Lopez. Um, I've been training jiu-jitsu for about three and a half years now, almost four years. Um, I got interested in jiu-jitsu while I was in the military, when I was in the Marine Corps. We did very basic, very basic jiu-jitsu, um, but it really interested me a lot. And then when I came back home, um, I found the gym and I started training. First, it was under uh, Misael Miranda, and then Fernando uh, Hatfield took over the gym. Uh, he's my current uh, coach, and we're under BTT. Okay, nice. And full disclaimer, um, that's where I train also when I'm home. So, uh, so Jose is a teammate of mine, and one of the reasons I wanted to have you on the show, Jose, is because uh, I noticed that after class, pretty much every time you're holding court, uh, we'll have class and then class will be over and I'll see Jose out in the middle of the mat with uh, two or three white belts 
and answering questions and offering advice. And I appreciate that about you. So, uh, thanks for that. Yeah. I always feel that, um, you know, a lot of times when, when, um, white belts come in and, you know, I, I remember when I first started, I, I, I was awkward. I wasn't sure what to ask. Uh, I wasn't sure what to do. You, you get, a, you know, a couple of moves during the class, but you really don't get to really start kind of implementing them properly. Um, because you need to, you know, you need to pretty much go over and over and over, uh, the technique. And so afterwards, and when I see somebody, when I'm rolling with them and I, you know, I see something they're doing over and over wrong, I won't like stop the roll in the middle words in the middle of the roll. But afterwards I'll say, Hey, can I show you something while we're rolling? I noticed you were doing this, uh, try doing this instead because you know, you're going to get rolled over or you're going to put yourself in a bad position or so on. And I try to correct some of their mistakes. Um, so that, you know, if they get better. They, they make me better. Because every time I roll against them, they're just getting, making me stronger by them being stronger themselves. Yeah, that's an awesome approach. I appreciate that. So um, I'm doing a, a little show where we're going to have three different competitors on. And they're going to talk about uh, three different positions that they like and, uh, or a submission. And so what would you like to talk about tonight, Jose? I like to talk about the uh, head and arm choke, you know, the triangle. Um, that's a submission that... I wouldn't say it's something I I was really good at. It's just something I became good at because I was constantly in the same position over and over again. And I saw it there. And little by little, I just it kind of became my move um, in the gym. And I've, I've completed it a couple of times in, during competitions as well. Um, and, yeah, it just just because of the regularity that I was be, uh, getting into certain positions, it just – it just became a natural transition to, to start going for that particular uh, position and, and finishing technique. So what position were you finding yourself in that you would set this up from? I would always find myself in half guard, either top or, or bottom. And when I would get on top half, uh, I play a, a smashing game. Uh, so I get that, um, that arm around the head, across to the other shoulder, and I pull in tight on their armpit and pulling in tight, pushing my, sh- my shoulder into their jaw. And um, I always found that in order to create that release of pressure, my opponent would always post their, their forearm across my neck, across my jaw, across my face, and they would always tend to flare it up a little bit too much. Um, and it just seemed natural. Like every single time, I would just give a quick shove with my opposite hand, with my other hand, my free hand, on their elbow and lo and behold there I am with my head under their under their elbow in a triangle position uh while my arm is still I mean my leg is still in the half guard I still found it fairly easy to to finish it even uh to get out of the half guard while I have that triangle in them yeah they kind of quit thinking about the half guard when they're fighting for their you know not to not go out so yeah yeah that's awesome so let me back up a minute. You say your opponent has their forearm across your chin or your neck and they're pushing and they flare too much. I guess as I'm lifting my elbow, when it gets to the point where it's 90 degrees off the mat, once I pass that point, that's when it becomes easy for you to get that arm across, right? Yeah, it's um, it's like uh, they're trying to create that space. You know, they're trying to create that space so they could bridge. And they could create a good frame, so they're they're pushing with their their arm across my jaw or my face, and they tend to lift their elbow ninety degrees from their body, you know, and somewhere around sixty to ninety degrees. They get it real high, close to the ninety degree mark, and it's easy for me just to give a quick shove and uh, and dip my head under their their elbow. And again, it was just something that because of the pressure that I was creating with my shoulder it forced them to, to try to relieve that pressure because it just, I know how it feels whenever I have somebody with, with good top pressure. And I, I don't think about anything except, you know, trying to get that pressure off of me. And so I try to create that as I was developing my game. And I saw myself in that position over and over and over again with uh, my opponent constantly doing that, bringing up their elbow. And at first it was a sloppy transition, but little by little, I just kind of fine tuned it. And uh, 
would do it real quick enough to where it caught him off guard, and I would catch him um, with my head under their elbow, with my hands locked in, in a full triangle position, but I was still in the, in the half guard, top half. So are, are you a driller? Did you drill this lot, or did you just work on it during uh, live training? I just I just worked it a lot on live training. Um, the the things I drill the more are um, faster movement drills. You know where I got to get my body used to doing certain movements, the certain twists of the hips, where I got to kind of use momentum to do those. I drill those more. This particular movement where it's kind of like you're you're slowly. It's like an anaconda. I mean, it's like you know you know what's going to happen and you're just slowly just putting that pressure and you're forcing your opponent to make mistakes. Um, and I found that that's what I was doing during the, during the live rolls. And it was happening more and more and more often. And again, in the gym, that's, you know, I kind of got known for that, even though I really wasn't, you know, looking for that to be my particular technique. It just happens that I always was in that position. And, um, what I did start practicing, though, is a lot of times they would put me in lockdown with my leg that was trapped in, or they would have a real tight uh, lock on my leg with a half guard. And what I did was start trying to uh, um, train or um, drill would be crossing my body all the way on the other side. So while my leg is locked in, my free leg, I would slide it across their belly and all the way through. So it would go all the way through and it, it, it would seem like I'd be off balance and they could flip me over. But because I have all that pressure on their, on their, uh, their shoulder and their neck, it, I was just too heavy on the one side. And once I get my leg all the way through across their body, I could easily push their bottom leg with my free leg and then kick my, kick my trap leg out. And I was already in the full position for, to finish the triangle. My whole body was uh, across their body and I was ready just to lean in with my, my shoulder to, to put that pressure. Yeah, that's awesome. It took me a minute, but I, I see what you're doing there. Um, that's good. Hey, let me ask you a question. Um, when you get it locked up a little bit, what's the one thing your, your opponent can do to make it difficult to finish? Or what's the one thing I can do that's going to give me a chance to escape? The number one thing that people fail to do is they try to push me off by pushing into me. They need to roll away from me and dip their elbow straight to the ground. They got to, I mean, they just got to drop their elbow as hard as they can to the ground, back to the ground from around my head. And once they get it to the ground, it's, it's, it's hard to try to lift it up when, without losing a little bit of the grip uh, that I have with my hands. So that's, that's the, the point where, um, I kind of have to make a decision from my standpoint, like, okay, do I want to keep on fighting this and maybe he'll lift his elbow again? Or do I see that I need to just change my position and uh, readjust and try to go for it again or go for something else? But yeah, it's um, most of the time when, when people get out of it, it's just, they just flat out just as hard as they can. They just drop that elbow to the ground and try not to get it lifted up again. Do, uh, do they end up basically giving you the back when they do that? Well, they're rolling away from me, but my body's across them, so so it's not really giving me their back. It, it's like they're just laying back flat, you know what I'm saying? Because their elbow, when when you put your head under their elbow, um, their shoulder is off the ground, and it's kind of like you got them lifted up a little bit off the ground with your head. Well, they got to dip that elbow back down to the ground and lay back flat on the ground. Um, and that's that's the uh, well, that's what I found the best the best opportunity for them to get out. I got you. Um, so, what's your usual plan when they do that? Where do you like to go next? From there, um, depends on how I feel their their energy level is because it is a very taxing for them. It's a lot of pressure on their necks, a lot of pressure on their chin. Uh, I put in a lot of top pressure. Um, they usually loosen up their legs a little bit while in that transition. So as putting that pressure, even though they, they might have their elbow on the ground, I still have good top pressure and I'm slowly but surely trying to get my, my trap leg out. And I usually just, if I'm able to get it past their hip, 
um, it's a pretty much a done deal that I'm going to, I'm going to pass the guard because they just don't have any leverage. They're flat on the ground. I'm putting pressure on their neck and their arm and they don't have any leverage to try to explode out of it. So once that, once that knee is past their hip, I just slide, start, keep on crossing it over. And, uh, I put pressure on the other leg with my, with my loose leg to kind of open up their, their thighs a little bit. And then I'm able to get full mount. Nice. Okay. Yep. That's, uh, that's kind of an acceptable result as well. I mean, a finish is nice, but yeah. getting to mount's pretty good. Uh, Jose, I appreciate you coming on here and talking some jiu-jitsu with me. Uh, did you have a tournament this week? Yeah, I had a tournament on Sunday at the Houston Open. Um, it was my first tournament as a purple belt. I just got promoted in December to purple belt. And uh, I got second place in my division. Uh, I did pretty good, but some reason I, it usually doesn't happen but for some reason man i was just i had no energy i was i got tired right away after the first match i did three matches after the first match i was i was dead and the second match i don't even know how i wound up winning because i man i had no energy probably with three minutes left on the match and but i was able to to stay on top keep good pressure and uh, finish up the round uh the third match it was you know it, once that guy got on top of me, is I, like I said, I had no energy, and and he was pretty much putting whatever pressure he wanted on me, and I was able to survive. And at the end, I actually, <laughs> funny enough, at the end, I had him in the position to finish with a triangle, and time ran out on me. <laughs> yeah, well, that's uh, uh, kind of surprising that you were low energy today. I don't associate that with you. Yeah, like I said, I don't, I don't know why. Yeah. Again, I, I don't know why. I don't know why uh, this particular time. Uh, that's usually not an issue with me, but, yeah. It might have been the nerves. Like I said, it was my first uh, Purple Belt tournament. I was a little bit more anxious than uh, the normal. Um, but, yeah, it might have been that. Yeah. Who knows? So so what's next for you? You got something else you're looking at coming up? Um, there's a couple of tournaments. I think one in March. Um, I think it might be New Breed here in Houston um, and I mean I know we train together so you know me I like to, to compete as much as possible yeah and okay. I, I'm trying to I'm trying to make a, a training four times a week and two times a month doing a open match on Saturdays and trying to compete as much as possible as long as my body could hold up I want to train as much as possible that's the only way I'm going to get better that's the only way my teammates are going to get better and, and you know when you're addicted to it, you know how it is. Yep, I know how it is. Okay, Jose, hey, I really appreciate you taking time to get on here and talk some jujitsu with me. All right, thank you, Joe. All right, we'll talk to you later. All right, you Bye. have a good one. I have on the line with me today, Pagan LaFont from Southeast Louisiana. Pagan, how you doing today? Pretty good. How's it going, BJJ Brick? Uh, I'm apologizing ahead of time. For my uh, accent, I'll try to really not have an accent because I'm down here in a uh, Cajun territory, and to me, everybody's uh, is it's pretty understand, it's pretty easy to understand everybody down here for me. But I know for other people, they'll they'll tell me you know some criticism like they can't understand me or it's very monotone. So I try not to do that. But I'm a uh, so I'm a brown belt in jiu-jitsu. I started in May of 2006. At a, a very small gym at the time that was only ran by two blue belts at the time, and it was a uh, blacklist martial arts and fitness. And from there, we had you know a large group that stuck with it throughout the years and branched off. I trained in the gym La Rose Jiu Jitsu down here in La Rose, Louisiana, ran by my coach and of course close training partner Buddy Kiff, who is a black belt under Tim Crater, as is. The ones we originally started with, who was like a brother, sister school to us, blacklist, martial arts, and fitness, which is uh, Derek Brew, and he's a first degree black belt under Tim Crater now. So that's kind of who we're under. That's our head guy, Tim Crazy Tim Crater, uh, Digital Revolution affiliate. And uh, with that, we came up under, like I said, Derek Brew, and then American Top Team black belt now, and uh, Gabriel Barahona. So that's a little bit about where we started out. We started real small. Uh, like I said, just built over the years, had to kind of, as our instructors are learning, you know, they were teaching us and we were learning. So it was a pretty rough time, I think, for sure. Now, jiu-jitsu has grown to where 
it's not that people are like spoiled to it, but it should definitely, you know, be grateful that there are so many, so many black belts and legit schools out now. There's so much on YouTube and just various things, you know, internet and social media. I mean, you can just get on Instagram and scroll through it and just see tons of little tidbits of technique. And uh, at our time, it, it really wasn't that at all. So, I mean, I remember going on Lockflow. I don't know if any of you guys are old school, but uh, Lockflow used to have, I think they ended up having little video clips, maybe toward uh, the later era of that. But it was, they would do these little comic strip style, you know, like, four to 12 little pictures breaking down technique. And I mean, I remember learning off of stuff like that. So, um, but yeah, I mean, that's, you know, that's what it is. Uh, I've been a brown belt since November of 2016, uh, pushing hard all the time. I trained solid five, five to seven days a week, you know, and, uh, rarely, luckily I'm 25 years old. So I rarely get injured to where it takes me more than, um, a few days, you know, or, or even a full week if that to, uh, to be recovered. But I train smart, always, uh, tap fast, you know, know my limits, um, eat right, try to get enough sleep, you know, lots of water. I preach the water thing all the time. I really fully believe in that, you know, uh, but yeah, this is definitely my biggest passion and I can go on about it all day. So where we started this, Joe? Well, before we start, uh, I just want to make a comment on the comic strip style instructions. I used to have a binder full of those things. I remember that uh, it was the only way you could learn technique besides going to class back in the day. So you're going back a few right, years I, there. I had a cheap little binder with some um, some of those little portfolio, I guess, style, like that, a plastic sheet. Yeah, and I would print them out and just stuff them in the sheets. And, and it was like a little portfolio for me to look through. Yeah, I had the same thing. So before we get started with the position and technique, we're going to talk about, uh, you mentioned you had an accent. I hope it's not a faux pas to have a coon ass on the show, but uh, uh, where where are you located? Um, Lerone, Louisiana, and that is about an hour southwest of New Orleans. And um, I mean, we're pretty, we're pretty close. I mean, within a 45 minute drive, I can be on the coast of Louisiana down in, uh, Port Fouchon and Grand Isle. So, I mean, that's where a lot of our people don't even know this area, but you'll be like, Hey, you know, you have to go through it to get to Grand Isle. And people know about that because it's a big area for fishing. And uh, we have some of the best fishing in the country down here. Apparently I've always just known it to be what it is. So I, I take for granted that it is what it is. But a lot of people say that it is just about the best fishing for, uh, redfish and speckled trout and whatnot yeah it's it's good fish and good outdoor life for our listeners who are trying to envision exactly where that is and what that country looks like just think the movie deliverance or the movie skeleton key and you'll have a pretty good picture of southeast louisiana they're about as far south as you can get in the gulf of mexico yeah, unless you go to florida no hills no hills at all where i'm at a uh, very flat land and a lot of marshy areas a lot of marsh um, there's some swamp more out east or west, you know, uh, where there'd be a lot of cypress There is that down here, but it's really mostly marsh. It's a lot of like, uh, brackish water where salt water and fresh water are meeting each other. So yeah, definitely an interesting place to visit. So Peg and I, I hit you up to come on and talk for a few minutes about, uh, one of your favorite positions and, uh, a technique from there. And I think you said you wanted to talk about, uh, the triangle choke from guard. Is that correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. That. When I started, I was small. You know, I was 13 years old, maybe 110, 120 pounds. I wasn't, I wasn't in bad shape. Like I wasn't, um, an overweight or, uh, really like uncoordinated kid, but I definitely wasn't like a prime athlete or anything. I, I played a few little sports growing up, but I was never like dedicated to any of them to have like a base of that athleticism, which, you know, when you have parents that are like, Hey, should I put my kid in martial arts first or sports? And I'm like, you know, whatever the, I don't have kids, but I would say as a kid's coach, I would say really anything that gets them physically active, whatever they find enjoyment in with it. Absolutely. I mean, you can definitely be, you know, a good, you know, dedicated, talented little baseball, basketball, football player, whatever. And those kids definitely transfer into martial arts well from the coordination, but also the kids who start with martial arts can coordinate over well. So I started really small, the small guy. So the reason I led to that is, being a small guy, you can about imagine where I spent most of my time the first few years of training on my back, getting crushed, having to learn how to retain my guard, keep my guard, you know, keep pressure uh, on the hips, you know, 
not getting bullied around. You know, I'm on my back from small guys. So triangles were, I'd say, the first submission that I really found success with in training and in competition. It wasn't, it wasn't like I didn't know other ones, but that was the one that always seemed to happen for me. And, um, you know, I didn't have, like, extraordinarily long legs, but I did have kind of skinny legs. And, uh, but I think it could work for a lot of people, you know. I mean, there's different ways to do triangles. And you can use the triangle guard or, you know, the shoulder guard um, to just create other options and, and, you know, bad case, whatever. I mean, there's just so many things you can do just from having a dangerous threat from your guard, such as, like, a triangle choke. So I think the biggest things, you know, um, especially with beginning, you, you'll, you know, get comfortable with that closed guard idea, you know, crossing the feet. And there's nothing wrong with closed guard, but the closed guard is a safety net, in my opinion, because you can't do much. Like, what can you do from closed guard across college choke? I mean, if you, like, flash the ball, you, think you might not have to, like, uh, well, no, I mean, you have to plant your feet on the on the mat to hit bumps. I mean, there's really not many options from purely having your legs crossed around the person. So, Cor- correct. It's really just a starting point, right? You start in closed guard, and <laughs> at some point you've got to open open your feet up a little bit to do something. So when you're in closed guard, how do you generally set up the triangle chill? Do you get a, get a grip on a collar, or do you just take a hand and shove it through? Tell me a little bit about your setup for this. For me, um, guard for me, it, and the way I always try – to like to preach just to you know um, train the partners who are a little less uh, less experienced that I can help them out tip swaz or, or the kids program that I'll teach. Um, if you're in closed guard and the feet are crossed, I like to have my shoulders on the mat but my my butt off of the mat, you know, because you never want your whole back to the mat, right? Like you don't want your hips flat. You don't want your shoulders both on the mat. You don't want your spinal on the mat. You're just getting crushed. You know, you just, that's not a way to defend yourself or be offensive by any means. So if the guard is crossed, I certainly always want to have my weight on my shoulders and like my head and like making them support my weight onto them. So, so so when you've got, so Pagan, hold on a minute. When you got your butt off the ground, then they're carrying the weight from your hips. Uh, You're controlling their hips, right? Right, and then, and to do things like the the easy ways to disrupt their base, like let's say with the closed guard, how you would like kind of do almost a crunch and pull your knees to either side to break their posture and disrupt their base. It'll be easier because they're holding your weight up. It'll be easier to transfer into that and really uh and and kind of be able to pull them and make momentum. Um, but I, like I said, that's kind of a a, a position to where I, it's a safety net. I can stall and catch my breath or whatever. But um, open guard. And the thing I always try to preach is, you know, like I said, not being flat. So I'm always going to be sitting up or, or really on, on one of my hips, but I'm always pulling, pushing and pulling. Like I'm always making reactions. You know, I'll pull the collar and I'll push off the hip or, I'll, you know, I'll pull the arm and I'll push off the hip or I'll, I'll shift my hips. And I'm always threatening to make my setups like a triangle. Sure. There are some times in the gym that I can just do a very simple grab the collar, grab the sleeve, put my foot on their hip. They go to grab my pants of the foot that's on the hip, and I'll, I'll shoot my hips up and snatch up to shoulder guard, right? But it doesn't always happen that way. You know, a lot of guys are keen to that, so I'll have to make other threats. So one that I love to do is I love to set up a uh, scissor sweep. And when I go to scissor sweep, I'll use that to set up my shoulder guard when they when they'll base and defend and try to grab my leg and whatnot. You know, that's one way. Um I guess just I've been doing them so long, a lot of times it's not even a thought out setup. Like I'll just start throwing out different attacks off my back and uh I'll just find little holes to slap my leg into. Um for sure the scissor sweep or arm bar is a great one too. If you can get up to an arm bar once they pull the arm out, bam, you know. Easy thing right there, or if you're setting up an Uma Plata and you go to a posture from the Uma Plata, the shoulder guard's right there. Um, for me, though, no matter how you get there, you know, the big thing is having your legs crossed around, you know, their head and one arm. You know, having one arm in to the shoulder guard. So, you know, you cause the feet. Always important to have the foot of the leg that is against the head. That's the one class down. And uh, the one that would be next to the shoulder is the one that's on top. So when I'm there, 
and I'm a big advocate for if I have a gi on, I'm going to always want to use gi techniques. For sure. Like, I'm not going to really go for a rear naked choke or a guillotine and a gi. I don't know why. To me, it's just like, why well, am I doing it? I'll say that for no gi. If I have the gi on, loop chokes and bow and arrow chokes, right? Yeah. But uh, but even with the gi, I always do the same thing. My feet are crossed, and I'll reach up, and I'll double clasp the back of the head like a Muay Thai clinch. Now, as their head bends down, it creates more opening for me to lock up that triangle. And, uh, it, you know, it compromises their posture. Sometimes I know a lot of people have to cut angles a lot with their uh, triangles. So that's for sure, you know, grab the shin and, and, you know, cut towards the hip. But for the way my legs are built uh, and just from doing them over the years and building dexterity in my legs, I'll, I'll lock them up straight in front of the person sometimes and then cut my angle. But almost always double clasp the back of the head and pull it downward before I uh, set up to, to close the triangle up and finish it. So a lot of people think of that pulling on the back of the head as part of the finishing technique, but you use it to uh, create more space and make a final adjustment before you go into the finish. Yeah, absolutely. Like, I don't, I'm never pulling the head to get the finish. I'm just doing that because, you, you know, like they're postured up. Like, as I'm, I'm, I toss my shoulder guard, they're going to want to posture up and get their head kind of to the ceiling and be strong so I can't break them down to me and clasp the foot under my uh under my knee, under the crook of my knee, so I can really finalize the triangle. So I'll reach up and I clasp the back of the head and make their chin go straight down to their chest. That'll break the posture, and it also makes the neck, you know, kind of collapse. And so it'll be easier for me to reach up, grab my shin, and pull it covering the shoulder, and then clasp the triangle all the way. That's golden, man. Yeah, anytime you can uh, compromise your opponent's spinal alignment, good things happen for you. Um. So you get to the triangle position, and you got a guy that's just thick neck, strong as hell. What's your go-to move if the triangle's not working? Well, the triangle's not me, and I, I do run into that. I run into that with you, Joe. <laughs> you have a lot of pressure. You have a lot of pressure. It screws me over all the time. It's very hard for me to finish the triangle on you. So when I'm there, I'll use the shoulder guard, you know, like that. I'm one of my friends, uh, Ty Landry, black belt buddy, I'm like, he, he calls it triangle guard. I'm, maybe I've heard other people call it that as well. But, as, you know, shoulder guard, right? One arm in. It's, it's before we close the triangle up. So if I'm there, I have to use that as a position in itself, knowing that if I commit to closing that triangle and cutting my angle, a guy like Joe here, he starts driving hard across my torso. My legs will collapse. He's just driving so much weight through. I'm Not only will I not lock the triangle, my guard's getting passed, and my hips are, you know, my hips are angled one way, my upper torso's the other way, and I'm getting passed with a lot of pressure. Now it's not comfortable. Now I got to fight back from square one. So for me, I'll kind of stay square with them. Like, I'll stay square because I know if I'm cutting towards the angle to finish my triangle, knowing how thick his shoulders and neck are, that's going to give him that pass. That's going to give him that, you know, that understyle pass. And, um, so I'll say square, and I have a few options from there. When I'm square, um, there's a little thing I'll do, like if their hands are clasped around, you know, like their hands are clasped. I've got this shoulder guard, but they have their hands clasped. I'll say square, and I'll reach between my own leg to that freed arm, reach behind their elbow, unlatch my leg as I do a big hip switch towards the thought that uh, – I was locked on their shoulder so that when I go, I'm doing an arm drag, but I'm pulling their arm against like my crotch. So what it does is it'll like collapse their arm in. So as I'm hipping out like a normal arm drag, it one of their arms will be trapped between my legs. So when I take the back with that, it's like a right to a trap arm back take. But that's really tricky. I don't, I'm not always successful with that. I kind of found it a while back. But other than that, a simple one, is uh, I just I would time as their freed arm would be close to their torso, and I'll unlock my shoulder guard and I'll relock my guard around their trapped arm. Now I have closed guard with one of their arms trapped. How efficient is that? I don't know if you guys ever play with a position like that, but that is just I mean that's that's all you for the taking. You know you've got your closed guard, the comfort of the safety net of the closed guard. Their arms trapped within your leg. They only have one free arm makes it really easy to set up collar chokes and different attacks from there. Yeah, you're almost taking away 25% of the tools they have available to work with. So it, it does give you a huge advantage. 
and, and you know, and that's like um, Ryan Hall breaks down on one of his uh, DVDs. You know, Ryan Hall's got amazing DVDs and the way he breaks down things. It's so theoretical and not even techniques so much as just an understanding. And what he was saying is that um, being on your back is looked at as like a, a, a disadvantageous position, like it's just, you have a disadvantage from being on your back. But if you know how to use your if you know your jiu-jitsu, you know, you know your technique, you know, you believe in your, you know, your attack and you're, you know, you're a proactive grappler, you're, you're making things happen off your back, you're, like, you're in a D advantage because although you're in your back, your two arms and two legs are free. That person has to be based on their feet or on their knees, right? Left head or on their knees, down, then you're closed guard. They're basing on their two knees. Their legs aren't free. The only thing they have free is their two arms. So it's already a losing battle because they are two Versus your four. If you trap one of them, we just made that, you know, four to one. Yeah, it's it's only a losing battle for them uh, once you realize that you have all four limbs to work with. I see a lot of new people grappling, and they got an arm just laying there not doing anything or a foot just laying there not doing anything. It takes a while for people to come around to the point where they're always using – I mean, your your feet should either have a grip on a hip or a, a cut behind a knee or so, something. Yeah, every, every you should have four points of contact always. That's a big thing you have to get through to kids. You know, you'll see like the, uh, you know, some kids just catch on so naturally and some of them are lost for a while or, you know, and I'll always tell them, I'm like, if you're not gripping, you're being gripped. So like if I'm on top of them, drilling with them or, you know, grappling with them, and they just put their feet on my hips. Awesome. That's that's one of the things I tell you. Fantastic. Your feet on hips. Where's your hands? If you're not gripping me, I'm gonna blow by your go. And like I always try to get that through. And like you say, to just you know adults too training. I'm like you always doing. You know nothing's just ever just there. You know, like why would you not use? And especially with the geese, you'll see these new guys with the geese. They'll try to grab your wrist or or grab the back of your neck. And I'm like, no, you have a gee on. Grip my sleeve, grip that gi, like use what you have, you know, and always make grip. Just having good grip will disrupt somebody so much. There's one way that I'll grab a uh, a, a cross collar grip with my left hand. That's what I'm always, because I'm always working on my right hip for the most part, uh, off my back. And uh, when I grab it, I'll grab it like a chin up grip. Like there's no bend in my wrist when it's against their neck. And when I grab it, I'm not dead squeezing, white knuckling, but I'll just, you know, I'll condition my grips to where I'll grab it and I'll hold that grip. But pretty much as long as I want. Now, people do break it, but to break that grip, they are going through hell to break it off, and that just creates more openings for me. So something as simple as a grip can shut down so much, you know, and, and create so much. I mean, it's, you have to be grips. Absolutely. Hey, let's wrap up this about the uh, triangle choke real quick with uh... – a defense for it. If if you're going for a triangle choke on me or or anybody, what's the one thing they can do to make it really hard for you? Well, this is um when it comes to triangles, this is a general note I always like to keep in mind or tell people is if the person locks the triangle and their feet are just crossed, just their feet, shoulder guard, posh. The feet are crossed, posh. If they have the triangle all the way locked in, that's when you stack. You know, you're not going to have the triangle all the way locked in and try to posture up and try to support all of that weight clamp down your neck while that also helps your arm get straightened out. I finished a lot of, you know, rounds in the gym and a couple matches and tournaments from people posturing up with the locked triangle, exposed that arm. But at the same time, if their feet are just crossed and you stack, now you're giving them the closure, you know, the space closing they need to lock up the triangle. Yeah, you just did, you just did half the work for them. Exactly. So, I mean, if, but if it's locked and you're stacking, big thing, pressure, 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 pressure. Don't try to, don't roll them, don't roll their knees beyond, side their knees beyond their head. That'll make it easy for them to do a back roll and land and mount on you. What you need to do is you need to put their knees to their face and just create uncomfortable position. And that's what I tell people when I'm trying them and they're like, why are you keep tapping with this? I'm stacking them. And I'm like, you're not stacking it. No, you make me uncomfortable. You have to make me miserable. Put my knees to my face. And just make enough space to keep that blood flowing and keep yourself surviving and just keep working. Keep cutting towards that side. Keep walking your hips towards the side, smashing them. There's also the defense where people will hug the side and just kind of flop to the side and work. I haven't really, I haven't gotten that one down yet. I just do the regular old stack the life out of them and keep uh, cutting towards the side 
of my freed arm while reaching across like their far shoulder or lapel and kind of driving the forearm. I'm not using the forearm choke, but I'll use the forearm to make them uncomfortable as I'm cutting toward that socket and stack them. All right, that's perfect. So, hey, guys, this has been some good stuff, uh, both from the offensive standpoint and also from the defensive standpoint. So, hey, Peg, and I appreciate you coming on with us. Thank you, Joe. Thanks for having me. Thanks, BJ J. Burke. All right, awesome. We'll talk to you later. All right, I'd like to welcome Shane Dupree to the BJJ Brick Podcast. Uh, Shane, how you doing tonight? Good, man. What about y'all? Oh, I'm doing good. We're recording this in person, so Shane and I just got off the mats uh, about an hour ago, had class tonight. Shane, how was it for you? Man, it's always a good time, you know. Uh, I've never I've never been in a training session where I left and I was unhappy with myself. Nice. And we had a promotion in class tonight, huh? Yes, we did. You know, we uh, promoted uh, some redneck uh, to blue belt, and um, it was well deserved. Yep, Delta Bar. I like being in class when we have promotions. So, uh, Buddy Kiff and LaRose has one more blue belt. So, congratulations to Brad. Uh, Shane, tell us a little bit about your martial arts background. Well, man, I've been um, doing martial arts pretty much my whole life. Uh, started Taekwondo at four years old, progressed into some kickboxing, and you know some other traditional arts that were in the area at the time of me growing up but um around 19 i started my own um taekwondo school in town because my coach just couldn't keep his open anymore so i went ahead and done that and um funny story is um when i was about 22 i was kind of falling in love out of out of love with martial arts all together you know it just I didn't see the realistic approach of some things even though um we were taught very like hardcore old school taekwondo um i kind of just started to fall in love with it i was finding reasons not to go and uh man once it gets to that point in your life where you're like oh man i don't want to go there i mean what's the point you know just like jobs why would you go to a job you don't want to do so um and it just so happened um buddy i was working with was good friends with uh buddy kiff and uh he's like hey man yeah i'm gonna check out this jujitsu thing and then i'm like nah man i'm good i do taekwondo and you know this and that and he started choking me out at work he would just come behind me and like put me in rear naked chokes i'm like dude i will go to your class and onboard you i know what i know what jujitsu is i follow this and uh sure enough i went on board the shit out of him that i never left i stayed there and um once the, buddy, buddy was a blue belt at the time. Yes, buddy was a blue belt, so. and we had two mats, and they wasn't. It was like the puzzle mat type uh, rollout deals, whatever it was. And I mean, we were upstairs, and it's funny because we were actually upstairs in the um, Taekwondo school was downstairs, and that teacher was part of uh, my Taekwondo organization, and I hadn't quit Taekwondo yet, you know. And when this guy saw that I was doing jiu-jitsu of course you know he showed other teachers next thing i'm getting kicked out because um i wanted to progress as, as a martial artist and i mean uh that whole scene man like they called me in a room four guys i mean like old school kung fu type movie you know and like you know for like 10 minutes i defended myself and then i just got to a point i'm like man what are these dudes telling me i can't like you know progress yeah it's, that's it's, crazy you know, think of the term martial arts. You know, no one says martial art. You know what I mean? It's plural. And then I I just asked him one simple question. I'm like, man, would did your kid ask you permission before he went to college? You know, I mean, come on. If he wants to hire, learn, what's the point of this? And, the, you know, I told those guys within five years, your organization is no longer going to exist because this is what it's going to. You know, you need to learn how to let uh be open minded. And it's so funny because. um we were all on a Dr. Lee. And Dr. Lee had a judo black belt. He had a, I mean, a hop keto black belt, a disc black belt, all this stuff. And we learned all these things. But they taught him in such a un, I don't know even how to explain it, just not realistic fashion. You know, right. some of this stuff would never work. And then once it started going to the whole Olympic style sparring and everything, I just, I didn't see the purpose of it anymore. So it, it was time for me to deport anyway. And uh, I wouldn't have it any other way. I'm not sour about the situation. I look back, you know, still to this day, I'm able to uh, help these people get ready for the cage at, you know, our local gyms and this and that. I mean, my kicking is still great. I keep sharp on it. Uh, I mean, that's something that you can never take away. But um, I I needed to progress in my whole ordeal. Yeah, I don't ever badmouth any martial arts. They've all got their value. But uh, 
there there comes a point in time where you are looking for somebody a little something a little more reality based. Yes, definitely. And jujitsu definitely uh, uh, meets that criteria. So, uh, Shane, I got you on the podcast tonight to talk about a position, uh, submission technique that has been working well for you. And I think you wanted to talk about uh, transitioning from closed guard to uh, open guard with your feet on the hips to uh, a loop choke uh, variation. Is that correct? Yes, yes. Um, something I kind of picked up from watching the uh, Hydra Gracie channel. Um, subscribe to it well worth the money i mean you know it's like 20 bucks a month but i mean think about how many times you get on youtube and like you just scroll and you're looking at all these things and it's like i don't know if that works right you know but i can guarantee you this when you follow somebody like that dude it's gonna work sure. you know no yeah, matter absolutely. what your body type is and um you know i kind of i am a uh medium to large fellow never the biggest guy on the map but i'm never the smallest um, my whole game has been a defensive game ever since it started. Nothing wrong with a very offensive game or anything else, but that's just what my body type took me to. And um, this particular move really caught my eyes. You know, a lot of times I find myself in a situation where I'm being pressured and I, I may have to go to a closed guard situation to um, get a guy off of me for a second to let me, uh, I don't know, breathe and think about what I need to do. But a lot of times you're in that closed guard, and if you got a guy that's really good, he's he's pressuring you. It's kind of hard to get out of that, and you almost have to give up that closed guard and let them go to uh you know you side control the pass, then make a move sometimes because you can't make an offensive move at that point. So um, you know this caught my eye, so I start off. I put um I grab their hands, just put them to the mat. Or if I, you know, their sleeve, whatever, whatever, I, I got to do to move, make their hands move a little bit. And then I, I grab, uh, I take both of my feet and I just put on their hip. Now, when I put it on the hip, I get my knees on the inside of their arms. And that kind of creates a uh, spot of guard situation. And uh, as I was explaining to you, you know, you got to think of, you got to think of your, your, your body as in the box and out the box. Right. So now you have control of all four of their limbs. Well, not really their legs, but you're controlling their hips, which is going to yeah, control the legs. You got their hips pressed to right. the mat pretty That's much. That's what I'm so, saying. Yeah. So they're going to – this, even though it doesn't look like you have the dominant position, you do. Yeah. You're, you're, you're in a control situation. So when I do this, I like to uh, take one of my hands, put it on their um, shoulder. As I do this, I like to shrimp out just a tad to where I can get a butterfly guard with one foot. Then I kind of shrimp back in. As I'm shrimping back in, my other hand's going to leave – the other sleeve and I'm going to get a uh, semi deep uh, cross collar grip now as I go in to get back to my butt that's when I use my leg my butterfly my uh, my leg that's on the hip to kind of push them out as they go out straight their neck's going to be open they're going to be straightened out I just sit up loop choke their neck and then if their arm is their arm is going to 9 out of 10 times is going to be straight out trying to base you can just go ahead and weave your arm in, and then that's where you have a very tight loop choke situation. Yeah, you're coming over the back of their neck with the other hand. Right, right. Yeah. Nice. Um, very dominant. Nice. And then uh, do you stay sit sitting up to finish that? Do you lay, lay back? I do. I do. I, I actually, what I do is I, I don't just stay sitting up, but then I kind of shrimp out to the um, where my butterfly hook would be. I kind of shrimp to that side. That way I'm actually creating more force, and that that's when it becomes an Ezekiel. Right. Okay. okay. But, um, you know, this works nogi as well. The only difference is you don't have a collar to grab, so you're going to go into um, you're gonna go into a deep guillotine in this situation. So then you go to your back and your side for your leg over and then um, revert from there. And you're a little more dependent on them driving into you in that scenario. When they have the gi on, you can pull them to you. Right, a right. Bit. You can pull into them, but like anything, you can bait them to do that. You know, I mean, let's be honest. Whenever you push into someone enough, it's going to want to push back. Yep. You know, it works good against bullies then. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Great. Nice. Definitely. So, um, I guess one of the things they can do to uh, uh, foil your attempt is if they're quick enough, they can kind of pop their head out and then start driving back into you again. What do you do in that scenario? Well, man, I mean, there's a couple of different things. If they are adamant about um, popping their head out or, or bracing and just not letting you get to that situation, um, what I like to do is uh, just go grab the forearm and then just simple butterfly sweep from there. Nice. 
simple butterfly sweep, and then I mean, then you establish your top control, whatever whatever fashion it may be. Nice. Um, worst case scenario, you can't land either. Just go back to your closed guard, and then revisit what you want to do. Nice. Sounds like that works really well. Um, and this is something you've been playing with live rolling. Having oh yeah. Some, oh some yeah. Success. Yeah, I definitely do a live rolling. And look, a lot of times. I may not get the submission, but it's definitely worked for me to where I can at least get somebody off of me. And then from there, I'll, if I got to go to a different uh, position, I can, you know, but it gives me enough threshold and enough breathing room because, I mean, jujitsu is all about having that um, base on base. You know, you got to have your body on somebody's body. Right. Once you give them room to move and this and that, that's when problems are created. And, um, you know, it helps me. Yeah. And, and if they don't pop their head out, but for whatever reason, you didn't get the grip at the right depth and you can't finish, you can still sweep them with the head tucked. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah so. you could sweep them more. I mean, from there, if if your uh, position, your hand position is not right, but you do have it sucked in, all you got to do is kind of like creep your hand up a little bit. Yeah, make, make some adjustments. And and then worst case, if, like, let's say you got that tucked in and uh, you don't you don't think you have the submission, you could just roll them. Roll them and get on top and then finish it. Yeah, yeah, that's a uh, nasty finish from that, the top. Well, hell yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know what you would really call it. That's like a white trash guillotine Ezekiel combo. It's it's brutal. Yeah. So Shane, um, you have an interesting training routine in that you split your time fairly evenly between two different schools. Tell us a little bit about that and a little bit about your training routine. Yeah, I mean, I I push myself really hard. Um, you know, I'm 31 years old, and uh, I just don't see myself stopping anytime soon. You know, life happens. Don't get me wrong. Um, but, man, I mean, with all the negatives in the world, this is my positive. It's my outlook. It's my escape. Um, it's just something I love to do, you know. And, um, you know, I, I have a home gym, LaRose Martial Arts. Um, I'm there two, three times a week. Definitely, I'm going to be there. Um, it's where I started. That's uh, where I'm going to plan on being you know i don't plan on leaving that place anytime soon we have a sister school in homa uh blacklist bjj um derek bro is the head instructor over there and i mean he's always been welcoming and uh we're all under uh tim crater you know and um i go over there man and they're they always uh welcome the doors this and that uh they do a uh a pretty good kickboxing program there as well so i get to get my kicks in and whatnot learn some punches and strikes uh, they got a lot of guys that usually are uh, getting ready for cage fights and whatnot, so uh, we get to do some MMA and stuff like that. Um, I tell you what, though, man, a lot of places in town, just like, I mean, I think pretty much anywhere is in the States, it's very welcoming, you know. That's the thing about, I think that's the main thing that blew me away with jiu-jitsu versus, like, any traditional art I had ever done because, like, you couldn't go from one Taekwondo school to the next. They would right. shun you out the door. They're like, whoa, man, what are you doing? You know, and I tried that a couple of times. I'm like, hey, man, well, I got a competition coming up. I just thought it'd be nice to spoil some fresh people. And uh, they wasn't having it, you know, over here. It's like, oh, yeah, man, come in, uh, get yeah. some training. And it's like, that's beautiful. I mean, you come all the way from Texas. Oh, yeah. And I mean, I don't think, I mean, you came to our gym and that was it. Yep. Yeah, no, it's a beautiful thing. Um, so, yeah, I, I train with Shane at LaRose Martial Arts when I'm at work, and uh, I've visited the other school multiple times. They're very welcoming. Uh, there's another school in Homa that's not associated with us. Uh, Evolution. Yep, yeah, but they're they're friendly. And, oh, yeah, they uh, let you in, man. Yeah, it's, it's a really good atmosphere here in Louisiana. So The scene's blowing up down here, man. Uh, Ten years ago, there wasn't much. You know, um, I mean, jiu-jitsu was... I mean, pretty much non-existent. They had, uh, I think Blacklist was open, uh, pretty much like a garage school, you know. Um, but it was there at the time with Derek and whatnot. But it wasn't much, man. And um, it was all ran. I mean, this whole area was just dominated by just traditional martial arts. And, I mean, I'm not knocking any of that, but, you know, that's obsolete now. Yeah. No doubt about it. Um, another another thing I like to do in my training routine um, I do lift a lot, um, more strength and conditioning type stuff. Um, but you know, I do like to lift, keep my body in shape. I do like to, uh, push the mass sometimes. And, uh, it's not like I ever want to be like some beefcake bodybuilder by any means, but you know, I, I definitely have a physique and a build that I want to keep. So, um, we'll keep doing that till uh, my body falls apart. 
Um, also, what I like to do in um, the world of my uh, grappling is, man, you always get, especially beginners, you know, there's so much knowledge coming in at one time. It's so hard. Like, man, I don't know. I learned this. You know, I learned half guard this week. Next week, is, it's full guard. Next week is this, is that. How do you uh, keep in contact? And like most people say, you know, you just go with the go with the flow till you start you start to really know what's going on. And I mean that's good, no. But I started doing this as a um, blue belt. You know, every month I take a position, a submission. No matter what we're learning, now, don't get me wrong. I'm not going to like um, just ignore what we're learning in class. Right. I'm still going to do those things. But I'm going to focus on, like, we're learning full gore, but my position of the month was half gore. That's what I'm going to. And that's what I'm going to work on that month. Um, still going to take the knowledge of what we're learning in class. But that way, it gives me a very systematic, simple approach to what I'm working on that whole month. You know what nice. I mean? Yeah, and I like that. It works great. Yeah, I like that. So before we go real quick, how long have I known you? Three years? Yeah, about R- three. R- roughly. About three. And, and you, you haven't been much of a competitor, and you weren't on the competition mats the first year or two, but you got on last year. You had a couple of super fights. Uh, you going to do some more coming up? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I've, uh, I've already put my name in half for the one that's coming up. Um, they got to fight the win coming up uh, next month. You know, if I get on the core, great. If not, I will go support my team members and whatnot. But, um, man, I tell you what. I actually fell back in love with competing when, like, the first fight to win came to town, like, two years ago. And I got to see, you know, all my buddies do it. And I'm like, man, I want that feeling. You know, like, it just, it kind of set a fire to me. And I was like, I'm going to do that. So, like, the following year, I mean, look, I was, that year, I kind of, I just, work was rough, this and that. I kind of fell out of shape for a little bit. And then um, that next year, I just, like, something happened. I just clicked. I'm like, man, I'm going to get in shape. I'm going to do this. And then, like. I got that first pro match, and I'm like, oh, man, I need to do it again. You know, and then I started competing at the local tournaments and whatnot. And, uh, you know, man, it's just competition is great for everybody. Um, I just always kind of felt, being that uh, I've done martial arts so long, that I just didn't have anything left to prove to myself. I've just been – I've competed so much, and, you know, it just – I guess you get burnt out on it in a sense. Um, yeah. You know, and everybody competes for different reasons. They got some people that compete for limelight. Some people compete to, uh, I don't know, for their self-ego, self-pride. But at the end of the day, regardless of what it is, it's always a good builder. You know, win, lose, whatever. You, you're always going to learn something when you get on those that uh, competition base and there's people watching you. And, um, you know, man, it's it's a tough pill to swallow if you lose sometimes and whatnot. But, I mean, you got to get over that. It's a character builder for sure. And, sure. Um, you know, man, I definitely see myself competing again. Uh, there's a Naga this weekend at uh, in New Orleans, and if if work allows it, I might go compete at that. Nice. You know. Yeah. Hey, before we go, is there anybody you want to give a shout out to? Oh, man, there's so many people. Oh, come on. <laughs> I don't know. I think I just shouted out to everybody. All right. So so we got Buddy Kip at LaRose Martial Arts. Buddy Derek, Kip, Derek, Derek Bro. bro. Yeah, uh, you know um, that whole squad gave uh, Barahona. It's another black belt at um, from uh, Blacklist. Uh, Cy Landry, which is a killer, killer black belt. Um, Cy kicked my ass tonight. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You got You got a picture. This dude's 120 pounds, five foot three, just straight killer. You yeah. know, um, dude's so good at what he does. Uh, you know, man. I think that's what I love most about watching people compete and, or uh, just walking into a jiu-jitsu school, right? Because, like, think about this. And I always tell people not to judge a book by its cover. You know, a lot of times you get these meatheads that walk in, oh, this and that. And it's like, well, put them with somebody like Isidore, which is, looks like a little, just a little nerdy guy. Yeah, he's, what, 110, 120? 110, 120 pounds soaking wet. And he sweeps you, puts you on your ass. And it's like, well, let that be a lesson. Now, let's be honest, 9 out of 10 people won't come back. Yeah. But you get that one guy, and he's like, man, I need to learn this. Because that dude did that to me. You know, what happens when someone my own size knows this shit? What what happens? Yep. So, I mean, it's a beautiful thing, man. It, it really is. is. All right, Shane, thanks for coming on. Uh, this went well, and uh, we'll see you on the mats tomorrow night, Wednesday night, sometime soon. Awesome, so. man. Look forward to it. Thank you. All right, thanks. All right, uh, those were some good interviews. Thanks, guys, for coming on. 
I uh, really appreciate three different uh, athletes and kind of three different ways of presenting their thoughts. And uh, so I really appreciate you guys coming on. Look forward to seeing you on the mat soon. Yeah, that was cool. And, uh, man, I'm impressed, Joe. Three interviews in uh, one BJJ Brick Extra episode. <laughs> That's cool. I, I like I like where you uh, went with that and and the, the idea of having more than one person and kind of covering uh, some of their favorite stuff. That's awesome. Yeah, it was fun. I want to mention our sponsor one more time, Health IQ. If, uh, as a responsible adult, you need to actually have life insurance. Okay, something bad happens to you, it's really money to help your family uh, try to maintain a resemblance of a lifestyle that is that is what they're used to. I guess would be a way to say, it. or you know, help things uh, progress to the next chapter in their lives without you. As depressing as that is. You have to have life insurance, especially if you're the main provider, but really everybody, because um, it is just such, <laughs> it's such a tragic time in anybody's life to lose somebody that's important to them, to, to also be hit with a, any financial burdens. Uh, money will make things easier and less stressful. So life insurance, it's a huge deal. If you don't have it, you need it. And even if you do have it, you're probably overpaying for it. Why are you overpaying for a life insurance? Because you're not getting credited for the healthy lifestyle you're living. You train jujitsu. You're on the mat, you're sweaty, you're training hard, you're getting better, you're treating your body well, you're eating right. Uh, Health IQ wants to reward you much like you would get a lower rate for car insurance for being a good, safe driver. You are treating your body well, and although we get banged up a little bit, actually we're going to live longer because we're healthy, we have low blood pressure, we have, uh, we're have we fit individuals. Check out their website. There'll be a link in the show notes. It's that easy. Check them out. They'll save you money on your life insurance because you are a healthy person. Simple concept. Great idea. Happy to have them as our sponsor. All right, gentlemen, I uh, I have a question here. And a lot of people ask this question. uh, And it's basically the the measuring stick question. How can I tell if I'm getting better at jujitsu? And I think that's a frustrating feeling, especially when we're new. It just feels like you're not getting any better. You got there, uh, you you were terrible. Two weeks goes by, you're terrible. Uh, two months go by, you still can't really tell that you're actually doing anything different than you did when you started. It's really a frustrating process, especially with the new people. How could you tell that you're getting better at jujitsu? Well, that's a good question, Byron. Um, I, I guess part part of the answer is you just got to stick with it long enough till you're not the new guy anymore. Um, if, if you're paying attention to class, you're collecting some technique, you're starting to understand the concepts, eventually six or eight months in, a, a new person will come in that's about your size and about your athletic ability, and, and then you'll be able to see it's working. In the meantime, I think you just have to trust your training partners when you're drilling, and, and if the move's going, you know, if you're having some success with it, and they say, I'm giving you a little resistance, then then you know you're getting it, and you just got to... I'd be happy about that for the time being. Yeah, and, and listen to your instructor and your training partners also. Um, one thing we need to do as good training partners is we need to let our lesser training partners, our newer training partners, know when they're getting better because they're not always going to know that. You could be at a school where everybody's trained four years minimum and some, some new person comes in and he's going to have a tough time with everybody out there. But as a training partner, if we see, you know, little hip movements or hand placements or, or you know, execute a move perfectly, you know, we need to tell that person. We need to let him know. Your instructor is also there to let you know. He's going to tell you when he sees stuff that is going better. Because, you know, a lot of times it's you, you kind of sometimes almost you have to tap people out to a lot of people to justify them getting better but that doesn't mean you know a tap has nothing to do with you getting better there's a lot of stuff you know just a little better shrimp or anything of that sort will show that you're getting better yeah and no no matter what you're learning about uh these positions and these ideas that you probably didn't know when you walked in the door i think that's that's a big part of the first little while at jiu-jitsu is just kind of getting an idea of what you don't know uh (laughs) and that'll start to pile up and like joe said when people come in less skilled than you, although you feel like you know nothing, it'll be a little easier than it would have been without your uh, skill and knowledge that you've picked up so far. And, and really trust. Look around the room. Everybody's good at jiu-jitsu. 
everybody does jujitsu. Of course, it's going to be hard to do jujitsu against those people. But you know what? They did the same process that you did. At one point in time, they were brand new. At one point in time, they didn't know anything about jujitsu. And that's the boat you're in right now. They got off that boat onto the next one, or maybe the next one after that. And just know that you're going to follow in their same footsteps, do the same similar training that they've done, and you're going to be, uh, you know, moving right along downstream. You know, I'll tell you. I'll tell you another easy way for people out there to find out if they're getting better at jujitsu. Come train with me. I guarantee you'll have a good role. You'll you'll get a victory probably. So uh, come train with me if you're south of Houston or in the New Orleans area. Let me know, and I'd love to train with you. And if you're up in Wichita, Kansas, uh, hit up Gary and Byron and uh, see if your jujitsu is any good on the mats. And Joe made a good point. It takes some time. You need to keep training. It's it's not something that's going to happen overnight. You know, just stick with it. And on top of that, you know, besides getting better at jiu-jitsu, you're getting better in life. You're you're making more friends. You're you're getting more flexible. Uh, you know, we talked about health IQ there. You're getting, you know, your blood pressure is probably getting lowered. Your cardio is getting a little bit better. You're working your heart. You're getting stronger. You're moving through range of motions. You're learning different uh body movements, you know, like how many people really knew how to do a proper forward roll before they started jujitsu. So you're learning forward rolls, you're learning break falls, you're learning, you know, all sorts of different positions that you had never done before. So you're, you're making yourself not only a better jujitsu person, you're making yourself more healthy, uh, you know, bit more agility, uh, just a better person. So, uh, definitely keep, keep going, keep training. Uh, jujitsu is the best. Absolutely. That's what, what we're here for. Jiu-Jitsu is the best. If we found something better, we would be doing a podcast about that. Uh, we really appreciate uh, the support we've had with this podcast. Uh, most of it, a lot of it has been with Patreon. It's a, Patreon's a website for people who make content like podcasts, artists, musicians, a lot of different things on there. But uh, most people go to Patreon. They say, hey, this is your brick podcast. It's it's a lot of fun. I'm really getting a lot out of it. It's helping me get better jiu-jitsu. I'm really enjoying the process because of that. It's worth a dollar an episode. It's worth $2 an episode. Sign up to be a contributor, and we'll send you a BJJ Brick gi patch and a sticker to show our appreciation for that. I invite you to the, fa- the private Facebook group. And uh, really, with this uh, event coming up, if you are on Patreon and you're able to make it to that event, we'll cover your cost uh, for attending the seminar. Uh, we know that <laughs> not all of our Patreon supporters will do that because, you know, they're all over the world. And really, we have a really impressive international support on Patreon. I think we have more international supporters than we do in the U.S. But uh, anybody who's able to uh, support us on Patreon and come to the seminar, we'll be happy to cover your uh, cost, uh, provided you didn't sign up just uh, the day before the seminar. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah. So do it two days before. <laughs> yeah, you're going to have a lot of witch top people signing up. <laughs> Man, we found a loophole. And there will be never be an episode after that because BJJ Brick will have to file bankruptcy. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Well, that's how it's going to all end. At least we know how it's going to end. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, so uh, if you want to help us out and check it out, uh, there'll be a link in the show notes. It'll be right next to the link for our sponsor. A lot of stuff in there. Links to our social media as well. What do we have, Joe, for social media? Yeah, if you want to help us out, you can't uh, commit to Patreon and a a little bit of money each week. You can still help us out by getting the word out. You can uh, tell a friend. You can find us on social media, share some of our posts, uh, like them, comment. I love it when we get interaction with the listeners on Facebook. So, yeah, we've got a Facebook account that's pretty active. Uh, Byron's on YouTube regular. Download the BJJ Brick app. That's the best way to get an episode every week. And, uh, yeah, check us out on social media, guys. All right. You had a great time with the BJJ Brick Extra episode. Looking forward to doing this the first week of next month. And, of course, we have our weekly show uh, coming out as usual. Uh, Thanks, guys. This was awesome. Stay sweaty, my friends. And don't forget to shower. Train hard, train smart, get better. We'll see you on the mats, guys. Thank you for listening. I hope you find the time today to roll. After all, the best way to get better at Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is to do Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Definitely going to go bad. But, you know, we were talking about staying safe. Staying safe is staying healthy. 
We'd like to. Uh... <laughs> that was good, Gary. That was so good. But then I, I didn't know how to change from there to get to uh, Health IQ. Thanks so much for checking out this episode. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope you learned something. Check us out next week. And don't forget to check out the archives at bjbrick.com or on this YouTube channel.